for the meeting. I'll give everybody about 30 more seconds to join, and then we are going to get rock and rolling. All right, it's 9.30. Good morning, everybody. I am excited uh, to talk to you today about 2024 NABOR forms. There's been a lot of changes. We're going to go through uh, all of them on the listing and sales contract and other forms. Um, this is going to be a fairly comprehensive review of the NABOR form since uh, really the changes since 2022 because we made contract changes in addition to all the settlement changes so again for those of you that have been on my presentations before um you know the drill you can sh unmute yourself and shout out your questions or put them in the chat i'm going to go through and i'm i may uh i'm going to pause at certain points to answer questions and um, again, if you have if you have thoughts or questions, just just shout them out. I put them in the chat. Now, of course, I'm an attorney, so the first thing we're going to do is have a disclaimer uh, that I am providing you advice that's not necessarily legal advice, and um, things can change at any time. Of course, that goes double with this presentation because of the NAR settlement that we're going to talk about. Uh, for those of you that I have not met or spoken to previously, of course, I've been a lawyer for 20 years. My offices are throughout Southwest Florida. I am the current scribe of the NABOR Legal Resources Committee that drafts the forms that we're going to talk about today. So I'm very familiar with those forms and how they work. And I'm happy to answer questions offline if you have them. Of course, uh, for those of you that know me, you know that I do real estate transactions for a living, and I have a title company, Paradise Coast Title and Escrow, also with offices throughout Southwest Florida. We now have five offices. And uh, we guarantee quick, accurate closings at the best price. So if you ever have a closing need, please consider either my law office or my title company for those needs. Today, we're going to talk briefly about the NER settlement. Uh, I've gone into detail on it in the past. I'm just going to give you the highlights today. And then we have a lot of substance to cover in terms of the NABOR contracts. We'll talk about the listing changes, the buyer broker changes, and the contract changes. So again, lots to talk about, lots to have a conversation about, and I encourage you to participate Um throughout this presentation. So just touching briefly on the NAR settlement, um, of course, the, the settlement was signed March 15th after oh, okay. NAR lost their lawsuit in um, uh, Halloween of, of 2023. And the big thing I want to point out on this timeline is November 26th. So we're going to talk today about a lot of changes, but the big question is, what will the judge do on November 26th at the final hearing? So we uh, may change everything. We may change a little. The Department of Justice has not weighed in yet. And so there's, there's a lot going on between now and November 26th in the courts that are going to affect uh, our practice of real estate. So stay tuned. For now, of course, though, um, paragraph 58 of the settlement agreement is the most is the operative paragraph for realtors and it eliminates and prohibits any requirements that listing brokers uh, make offers of compensation to buyers or buyers brokers that doesn't mean you can't of course have offers of compensation that's no longer required uh, they can't be unilateral they can't be unconditional which means you can now make conditional offers of compensation you can't put your compensation anywhere in the MLS, not in any field, any kind, any reference. I think everybody knows that at this point. 
Uh, brokers, of course, can share their commission information as long as it's more than one click away on their own websites. So that is, that's still a way to advertise your commissions. Uh, and of course, all this went into practice on August 17th, but MLS in Naples, Southwest Florida, removed everything August 1st and is allowing concession language to be in the MLS, but you cannot um, state the amount of the concession. You can merely state the concessions are offered, that they are not offered, or that they are negotiable. And the, the, the buyer broker agreement must be in writing now. So when you have a buyer prior to touring the home, remember that's the operative phrase, touring the home, you must have a written buyer broker agreement and it must conspicuously disclose the amount or rate of compensation or how the compensation will be determined. Uh, it cannot be open-ended and you cannot receive compensation from any source that's not in your buyer broker agreement, which makes those really, really, really important, which is why we're talking about them today. Uh, and of course you can amend your buyer broker agreement and your listing agreement and your contract as needed, as agreed by all the parties to get the commissions correct. A few other things to think about in the settlement agreement. You cannot say that, buy, that services to the buyer are free. That, that's what got us in trouble in the first place. So be careful about doing that. You cannot, um, I'm sorry, you must conspicuously disclose to sellers and obtain the seller's approval for any payment to the buyer. So you cannot, uh, hide the fact that the uh, sell from the seller that the buyer is getting compensation. And of course, that, that sounds weird to say, but it's happened. Uh, and you cannot filter or restrict MLS data by compensation. And of course, with the fields being removed, that makes it virtually impossible. Okay, so let's talk about the forms. And to do that, I am going to be switching screens to some PDFs. So everybody hold tight. This. All right, give me one second as I figure out how to do this. Yeah, that's fine. That's not a problem. How do I end the screen share here? Whoops. There we go. Okay, can everybody see the PDF on the screen? I see some thumbs up. That's good. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go through the listing and buyer broker agreements and the other forms. Uh, in, a, in some detail, we're going to use the red lines. I'm going to be switching back and forth between the red line, and I will show you the final version of some of these forms to make it easier for you to see and understand how they work. Um, starting off, we're going to talk about the listing presentation and the changes. First off, right at the top, you'll notice that you no longer or have the exclusive right and authority to sell real property, but you have the exclusive right and authority to list, market, sell, and procure a buyer of real property. That's more of a clarification, but it does state more what you're going to be doing. You're going to list the property, market the property, hopefully sell the property, and procure a buyer. And uh, some of these other red lines that you see on here are, are grammatical corrections, the effective date change, it, you're going to see that throughout. Really, that's just because effective date does not have a defined term and should not be capitalized. Uh, you are looking at a potential sales contract. You're not looking at an actual sales contract. Uh, so we change potential in there. One big change is the default is now a year, 365 days. That was asked by a number of brokerages to go from nine months to a year for the termination date. So 
as you know, in the listing contract, you should put your start date here and your termination date here. But if you fail to fill in those blanks, then the new default is 365 days from the date it's signed by the seller uh, or effective. So signed by the seller and the broker. Again, um, clarifying that, that the broker's obligations are to make an earnest and continuing effort to sell the property and procure a, and procure a buyer. So that's more of a clarification. One thing very, very important for you to note, look at your dates on all of your forms. If it doesn't say 2024, you're using an old form and you're probably not in compliance with the NAR settlement. Well, you definitely would not be in compliance with the NAR settlement. So make sure your form says 2024. And the dates are a little different because we amended throughout the year. I think the plan for NABOR is to bring the date forward to January 1 of 2025 when we complete all the revisions this year. But for now, you're looking for a 2024 date on all of your forms. Please, please make sure that you get the 2024 version. Okay. Again, we're, uh, a big change in NABOR is the nomenclature, the, the way we refer to everybody. No longer will we be using list uh, selling broker or cooperating broker. Everything is buyer's broker. So when you see your forms, everything is buyer's broker. And uh, that, that's the changes that you see on the screen now. This change here, if elected under paragraph 4K2DI, is the compensation section. So you, the, uh, and again, we're in the um, broker's obligations and that's to pay the buyer's broker if elected under that paragraph. And we'll get to that paragraph, of course, in a few minutes. So again, these changes that you're seeing, the red lines are all just changing to buyer's broker from cooperating broker, not substantive changes, just nomenclature changes. Okay, so how do you get paid? Um, well, broker compensation, I'm gonna show you the red line that I'm gonna switch to the, uh, the exclusive right in a, or the, the, the non-red line version of this so that you can see it. But I want you to see all the changes that were made. Obviously, it's quite a lot of changes to the compensation section of the listing agreement. First, of course, is this disclosure you're going to see this everywhere on everything. Compensation paid to a real estate broker and or any broker's commissions are not set by law and are fully negotiable. And then you'll notice in here that it's basically a complete redo. And I'm not going to try and explain all the redo. I'm going to show you the final product. But I want you to see what the differences are. Lots of moving, moving around and changes of language here. So with that... Can everybody see the clean version? Or is it still the red line? Clean version is up? Good. Okay, so this is what it looks like. You'll see here, seller shall pay total compensation to the broker. If a buyer who is ready, willing, and able to purchase is procured, you put your percentage of the purchase price here and you check the box for percentage. And then if you're all, if you've got a transaction fee or a broker fee that your seller normally pays, that goes here. Now the big change of course, is the next little section. Broker has explained to seller that if the seller offers to compensate buyer's broker or has procured the buyer, such buyer broken compensation will be deducted from the compensation. Remember compensation is the total amount paid by the seller. And the seller now has two choices. This is different than Farbar. The seller has two choices. Either the seller elects to permit the broker to offer a share of the compensation to the buyer's broker, or the seller does not permit the broker to offer compensation to a buyer's broker. So Farbar, of course, allows the seller to pay direct, allows the seller's broker to pay, or has no compensation. Nabor has taken the position that it's not going to have a seller paying the listing agreement, although you'll see that is different in the 
in the sales contract when we get there. So um, Namor has these two choices. If you elect to permit the broker to offer a portion of the compensation, that is pay the buyer's broker, then you check the box as a percentage of the purchase price, or you pick a fee, or you pick other, you know, and, and we joke at the Legal Resources Committee, this is if you're trading horses or something. So um, before I move on, I want to make sure everybody understands the new compensation in the listing agreement. Does everybody shake your heads, thumbs up, or unmute yourself and ask a question? Everybody understand the changes here? You, you have uh, two I hope things might change. We discussed that with Mac and I. Sorry. All right. So I'm not seeing any changes in, or any questions in the chat yet. I'm seeing a few thumbs up, so that's good. If you have any questions about this, filling this out, obviously this is very, very important because this is how you get paid. All right, going through the listing agreement back in the red line. The next up, we talked about this briefly at the very beginning, seller concessions are allowed, of course. Seller concessions are different than compensation. Seller concessions are where the seller pays directly to the buyer for whatever needs to be paid for. It could be closing costs and prepaids, um, but it may be used towards payment of buyer's broker compensation. And you have, again, the choice of elects to not to offer concessions or does elect to offer concessions to the buyer, and you put the amount or the percentage of the purchase price in these blanks. And you can see here, it's a percent of the purchase price towards buyer's closing costs and prepaids, which amount may be used towards the payment of compensation to a buyer's broker. This is how Nabor is handling the um, seller paying the buyer's broker directly. If you were gonna do that, you would offer it as a concession to the buyer. Does everybody understand that? It's it's different than the far bar forms where you, this, where you check the box for seller pays buyer broker directly. Here, if you want to pay the buyer broker directly from the seller and not have it as a portion of compensation, you would elect no compensation here and you would fill in the concession portion down here in, in uh, Paragraph L. Okay. Okay, I see a question from Jillian. If sellers proactively offering compensation to the buyer's broker through the seller's broker, but the buyer broker requires less compensation than what is indicated in the listing agreement, does the excess default to the, go to the seller or the seller's broker? Jillian, that's an excellent question. To answer that, I'm going to switch back to the other form so you can see it more clearly. Whatever the listing agent puts in this box here, I can clarify that. Do you can see that? Um, in this yellow box here, that is the amount that the listing agent is getting paid. If they're going to share a portion of that with the buyer's broker, that is going to have to be indicated. Um, I'm sorry, that's indicated in this yellow box. Whatever the, whatever the, whatever the listing agent is getting paid is here in this box, I apologize, I that's backwards. And the, the share portion is this box down here. Um, I'm getting questions. Um, what's wrong with Joe's camera? I can't see it. Um, what I, sorry, everyone, there was a, someone had a question about something on the screen, but it's okay. Um, a, an example of concessions to the buyer versus broker compensation. Well, if, if the seller was willing to cover closing costs and prepaids, but not cover uh, the broker commission for whatever reason, they could offer a percentage or a flat fee in the seller concession section down here, or they could uh, or they have the choice or they can get paid. The, the, the buyer's broker can be paid directly from the listing agent. I mean, that's really, really the two choices. All right. Now, 
Let's see if I answer everybody's questions. Jillian, if you want to unmute yourself, Jillian, ask your question. Go ahead. Hey, thanks, Sam. Hey, thanks for doing this class. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, we, we get this question a lot. Um, and as a broker, we're seeing a lot of commercial bribery out there and agents not following our code of ethics uh, according to what's indicated on the listing agreement. So I just want to clarify from an attorney of what the default is. So a seller is proactively offering compensation in, in the listing agreement, they've checked the box for offering compensation. Correct. They they are let's okay, say so they're elect they're electing to permit broker to offer a share of compensation. Yep. Yes, but through the transaction, the buyer broker only require requires less compensation. So the buyer broker will be receiving less compensation. Who gets that excess compensation? Is it the seller? Is it the buyer? Or is it the seller's broker? Seller is the buyer. So in this agreement, and I'm and I apologize for switching back and forth so much, but it says here, mm -hmm. seller shall pay a total compensation to the broker. So whatever is in this box here is what the broker gets. So if you're saying that this number down here is more than the buyer broker agreement, correct. The, the settlement statement I think controls. Um, and it says that the buyer pays X, whatever that X is. So this box here on line 142 is more than X. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it goes to the listing agent because the listing agent gets this percentage. Mm -hmm. and this is only a share of that percentage. So I, I would argue that it goes to the listing agent. Now, I, I, I the, agree with you. Could the seller come yeah. back and say, no, 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 you right. know, X and Y should add up. And if they if, if the buyer's broker is getting less than Y, I should get that back. I, I'm not sure I agree with that because this thing says seller shall pay total compensation to the broker in this amount. So I, I, I'm, I really think that's the answer. What do you think? I, I appreciate that. I think that's the way the neighbor contract is written, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, the far bar is a little more clear. So so just as a note, it's really important that our listing brokers, knowing that that loophole is in there, that they are extremely ethical and honest with what the seller is proactively offering and that that may be a point of negotiation. So thank you, Sam. It, it is a point of negotiation, but I think if it get push comes to shove, you got to, the, the courts in Florida are very clear. I mean, if you read any court case on a contract, the first sentence in the in the court's analysis is usually we follow the plain meaning rule. And this clearly says seller shall pay total compensation to the broker of and puts a number. Yeah, I, it may be problematic in the future with, uh, you know, w with that language. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. All Sam, right. um, this is Mike. Mike can, I, can I ask you a question, a follow up awesome. question on that? So. The way the process has been working is somebody sets up a showing, a, a buyer agent sets up a showing, and then they'll ask the listing agent if there's any compensation being offered on the property. Right. And so the listing agent um, communicates what, if anything, is being offered on the property. And then the buyer agent says, you know, thank you very much and goes forward with the uh, showing. In the example we just talked about, the listing agents and the listing broker doesn't know how much the buyer broker agreement totals. Right. Um, so in the example we just talked about, they don't really know if there's any, uh, like the listing broker doesn't know if there's any difference between how much the seller is offering um, as far as compensation to the buyer broker, um, they don't know what, if any difference exists. Yeah. So the seller is going to go, and my, of course, I am a real estate attorney and a real estate agent. And I, and I don't sit in these meetings with these sellers, but my understanding from talking to so many of you is you go to your listing presentation, you state, I want to get paid X. I think we should offer a portion of X. Y, we'll call it, to the buyer's broker. And it's typically half of X. That's That seems to be generally the way it goes. 
But what happened? The question is, what happens when Y is bigger or more than what the buyer's broker, who's bringing the buyer sometime later after the listing has been posted to to, to MLS and all that sort of thing? And how do you how do you square those two those two numbers? And the settlement says very clearly, very plainly that buyer is only obligated to pay what's in the buyer broker agreement and the buyer's broker only gets that number, whatever that is, Z. So if, if you've got Y here and it's more than that, according to this, the way this agreement is written, I think it goes to the listing agent. Gotcha. So okay. I, and I, I, I feel that sellers might say, well, wait a minute, you were only supposed to get X less Y. And I know we have to talk like this because we're in a public forum and so I apologize if it's confusing, but X less Y, and now you're getting something more than that because, because the, com the compensation is less. I think that listing agents probably are gonna be working with their sellers to keep their customers happy because they want that five-star Google review. And I, I think that's a really big deal um, going forward. And I do think that Manabor may need to clarify that. So we'll work on that. The committee is doing a lot of work. There's a lot going on and we're getting through it. Okay, let me just check the, the comments. Kathleen, you're correct. You can amend your buyer broker agreement. It has to be signed by the buyer. And Yola, you have a great question. Why can't the listing contract be more clear? God, I wish it was. We're getting there though. All right, let's move on. Um, other changes that are, are important to you in the, the uh, listing agreement. One thing here, the seller has to provide more accurate information, accurate and current information for any association governing the property. This is a seller's obligation in the, um, in the listing contract. Uh, this has been a problem in the past, so we're trying to correct that. Um, next, next comment, you know, next change is that the, um, the, this is where you list the sales contract obligations in the event the broker procures a buyer for the property. And unless it provides otherwise, the seller agrees to provide and pay for the title evidence and verification of compensation if elected. So the seller is going to verify the compensation that's being offered in the listing agreement. And that could be as simple as, as the uh, looking at the settlement statement and understanding that the that the compensation is correct. Uh, and I'll take a moment here in my office, we are not gonna be demanding that we see the listing contract and the buyer broker agreement. We're gonna have you as a realtor fill out a commission verification form and each side will fill out a commission verification form and the buyer, the seller, the listing agent and the buyer's agent will all review the settlement statement and sign off on it prior to signing at closing. And so that we know that it's correct and that the, that the distribution, at, the, the disbursement at closing is correct. Okay. Um, the other thing is here, the seller is agreeing to pay the seller concession to the buyer. That, that's a new addition to the listing agreement. And we put all this in, all of this language in the listing agreement and it matches the contract, remember, so that when they sign the contract, they're already aware of what their costs are going to be. They know they're going to verify compensation. They know they're going to pay a seller concession. They know they're going to pay for FERP and whatever else is listed in this paragraph. And so these are just additions to clarify what the what the concessions and 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 the verification are. We have some more questions. Um, Okay, so Brooke is saying that the broke buyer broker compensation paid by the seller is not negotiable if it's agreed to in the agreement prior to listing. Brooke, you are correct that the buyer broker compensation is not necessarily negotiable if the seller agreed to it in the listing agreement. I think what Jillian and Mike were talking about is what happens when the uh, the the buyer broker agreement shows that the buyer is paying less 
than what the list seller is offering is as, as, as compensation. And you have to address that. Um, Sam? Yes. Oh, <clears throat> I, I'm referring to uh, Mary Ann's comment where she said you can um, change the uh, buyer broker compensation if the buyer submits a lowball by adding additional lines on the listing agreement. Well, you can always amend the listing agreement if, if, if the if the buyer comes in at a low offer. Uh, well, I should say this: it depends how the compensation is stated. If if the if the what I'm seeing is a lot of offers now have the compensation that says seller shall pay X percent of the purchase price to buyer's broker at closing and it's just written into the contract or they're using the new addendums that I'm going to go over. Um, if it's a low ball offer, I don't know. I don't know that you'd have been the listing agreement, Mar Marianne. I think you would just negotiate in the contract. Um, and her yeah. response, her response was an answer to me where I'm saying I'm request a seller, a, a listing agent is verbally telling me they're providing X amount commission to the buyers uh buyer's broker yet they will not um provide me the broker to broker compensation agreement until they see our offer in right that's, happening, that's that happening a lot yes okay so that is not uh that is not um kosher for lack of a better word to i mean they should be provi providing us the compensation agreement well, they, the, in, in a perfect world, you would like to have that information when you make your offer. But again, it's not required. And remember what I said at the beginning, not only are sellers no longer or seller listing agents required to offer compensation, but they can make conditional offers of compensation. So they can say, I'll give you X if your purchase price is above some threshold. They can say, I will pay, they, you know, I will pay X if the concessions are zero. The, it, what this settlement agreement really has done, especially that language, is it really means that you are negotiating it in multiple directions with multiple parties all the way through at least the as-is period of the contract to get, to get the contract in a position where everybody knows what the purchase price is, what the concessions are and what the compensation is and sellers, you know, I, I agree with you. It would be better if, if listing agents just said the compensation is X, but they are not obligated to do that. And you have to understand that you may come across a listing agent who's got a seller or a listing agent individually who's, who wants to, wants to get the best deal for their seller. And they're going to say, you make me an offer with compensation and I will uh, take it to my seller and come back to you. And, so and what I, does that listing agent's uh, listing agreement look like with that seller at that it, point? It, 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 and that's a really good question because if I go up here and I'll show you the language, um, where is it? Let me go to the other forms. You can see it better. Read this here. It says... Broker shall pay. So if you're in a neighbor, if you're in a neighbor listing, I, I have argued many times already that on a neighbor listing, the, the 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 seller has agreed and the broker shall pay. So there's no reason not to split to tell the buyer's broker what the comp the co broke is, what the compensation is. Yes. Okay. And I and I think that's the way to go on the neighbor forms. But 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 the far borrow contract has different language and it does not say shall pay. So that's where you're going to see more negotiation when it's a far bar listing agreement. So you may one of your questions may be, are you under a neighbor contract? We can uh, ask that. What? We can ask that. You can ask whatever you want. You can ask. Okay. You can ask to see a copy of the listing agreement. You're not going to get it, but you can always ask. Say, are you using a fire bar or a neighbor listing agreement? And I mean, and I see realtors getting into these to the weeds on these details all the time. I think it's I think it's important in certain circumstances, but um, it, I just want to reiterate. I think it's a negotiation all the way through the process now. And you're going to have to be prepared to do that.
And I see that Jillian, yes, Jillian, um, Jillian, the code of ethics, is, I'm seeing a lot of language from NAR that that is not 100% correct, Jillian, about the seller offering compensation to the buyer's broker, then they must be truthful and in the exact amount. It depends on what the listing agreement says. The code of ethics is unclear, in my opinion, on that point. So we'll have to, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. All right, getting back to some of the other changes, because again, there are a lot. Okay, so the seller now has to provide at the seller's expense all current association information and required association application forms. I will tell you that there's going to be an addition to this because the seller is also going to provide association documents. So I think this is a nice change for listing agents and for buyers, brokers who are sick of chasing down sellers for documents. Um, next up, again, the, again, these are all just um, uh, uh, formatting changes. Okay, very important, very, very important for you and your broker. The notice provision of the listing agreement has changed. When the seller gives notice to a sales associate, that's a you know one of the a real their realtor, their listing agent, it is not notice to the broker. See this language I've highlighted here? It is not notice to the broker. The broker must be notified in writing at the information provided here. See here, broker's mailing address, broker's phone number, broker's firm name. This is where you indicate how the seller gives the broker notice. This is a somewhat important change because it used to be that notice to the agent was notice to the broker. That's no longer the case. And then we also move the wire fraud information up into the contract that's now above the signature line. And that's important because this, this wire fraud notice has saved at least one major brokerage in Naples a lot of money. All right, leaving the listing agreement, and I know some, if you have questions, we can always talk at the end, but I do want to get through this. Let's talk about the buyer-broker agreement. Now, the buyer-broker exclusive agreement has been around for some time, but it has changed, obviously, substantially. And so we're going to go through the buyer broker exclusive agreement here. So switching our hats from listing to buyer. Um, you agree, the, you, know, you talk about the broker's role, talk about re it's now residential real property. Um, the, the broker, you're gonna use the best efforts to tour the home. That's an addition. So identify, locate and tour the home. And then you're going to pick your brokerage relationship now. That was that was not uh, in here before. So the brokerage relationship in the buyer broker agreement is transactional, single agent, or no brokerage relationship. If you don't pick one, the default is transaction relationship. That's of course very important. That follows state statute. And then we have. Uh, some formatting, these are formatting changes just to move during the term of this agreement over formatting changes. Okay. So the next is the compensation. And I think that I don't have the buyer broker PDF, the clean version. So we're going to go through this one. Again, there's the disclosure that real estate uh, compensation is not set by law and is fully negotiable. And then the, you have, uh, for each property chosen by the buyer, you have three choices. Either you pick, either they pay a percentage of the purchase price and a flat fee, or a flat fee, or something else. So similar to the listing agreement, in your buyer broker agreement, the buyer agrees to pay this. And this is all the buyer is obligated to pay. So if I can just 
reiterate that whatever you put in this box, in this in this space, that is all the buyer is obligated to pay. So when you're going back and you're talking to the listing agent, if they're offering more and you as the buyer's broker want to be paid what the listing agent has offered, you will have to amend your buyer broker agreement and, and NABOR provides an amendment form. If you are, this prop, this buyer broker agreement is also useful for leasing operations. So you can do percent of gross rents and a, and a flat fee or just a flat fee or other. Now, this is the settlement part of the buyer broker agreement that had to be modified. And basically what this says is that the compensation is earned when the property is placed under contract, leased, or optioned by the buyer, it says that, um, where is it? I apologize. Buyer shall be responsible for the compensation to be provided to, to be paid to broker, provided, however, broker is authorized to negotiate for the seller or the listing agent to pay a portion of the compensation. So, you you write off say that the, we write off say that the 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 buyer pays the compensation to the buyer's broker, but that the the agent can go back and try and get get it from the seller. So that that's a very important, I think, for buyers who are worried that when they sign this exclusive agreement, they're going to be obligated to pay pay a commission if they buy something, and that's not necessarily what they're going to pay because many many listing agents are offering compensation. So you have to explain all this to your buyer. And um, the other thing that's in here is the buyer and broker acknowledge that concessions may be used towards the payment of compensation. So if, if the it, to match the listing agreement, if the seller is offering a concession of X percent, a portion or all of that may go towards buyer broker compensation. Um, and again, this just reiterates that. Okay, the, 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 the compensation is due upon the earlier of closing or buyer's right to occupy and control the property. So that's a little strange in my opinion, but that's the way we wrote it. You get paid at closing pretty much. You're gonna be paid when the title company distributes the funds, but, the, um, but you've earned it at close, your right to get paid is at the right of occupancy, which I, I've actually never seen that happen. If the buyer defaults under any contract, you are entitled to compensation. So if they sign a sales contract and then they are found to have been defaulted under the contract, they owe you money. And I think that's going to be important. And then the other, the next sentence, of course, here is the, the one that's very frustrating. Brokers shall not receive compensation for broker services from any source exceeding the compensation agreed to in this agreement and shall disclose to buyer the amount of compensation, if any, paid by the listing broker. So you cannot get paid except for what is in this agreement, and you may have to amend it. Okay. If the buyer defaults under this contract to purchase a rent or otherwise breaches this agreement, it continues in full force and effect, and again, you can get paid. So you've got two opportunities where the buyer may not own a property, but you will get paid if they default under their sales contract or if they default under this buyer broker agreement. Okay, other changes or any questions to this? This is a lot to, comp to, to get through. Questions about this in the buyer broker agreement? I see, Catherine, your comment about buyers don't like the word exclusive. And there is a showy agreement that we're going to go over as well. So that's an alternative if you don't like exclusive. So, okay, so they'll show the buy the broker cannot, buyers brokers must show properties regardless of concessions or of compensation. Uh, what well, do I mess that up? Of compensation. But they are allowed if the buyer says in writing, don't show me properties that don't have concessions for you to skip those properties and the buyer would make that election here. So say that again, cause I messed it up. Buyers 
may say, do not show me property without concessions. You, as the realtor, may not filter properties based on compensation. And then uh, next change is the, we just change it to clarify that Florida law controls. Again, look for your 2024 dates. And then we completely rewrote the miscellaneous terms. <laughs> and um, the most important thing here, of course, is again, the notice to the licensee is not notice to the broker. It's important that you fill out your contract completely with your broker contact information, your address, so that proper legal notice can be given. That's a big deal. Okay, now if you need to amend your buyer broker agreement, it's very simple. Nabor provides, and I'll zoom out so you can see it, a blank amendment to buyer broker agreement, and you fill in the term changes. Now, you've probably, if you've been on other Zooms with me or if you've been in the Nabor classes, you've heard lawyers at the Legal Resources Committee tell you, do not invent language. Talk to an attorney. That goes just the same for this. Unless your broker agrees with and signs off on, of course, they have to sign this, broke, this, this amendment form, you should not be drafting amendment language to the buyer broker agreement. Check with your favorite attorney, talk to your broker, um, but don't just fill in anything you want here to amend the buyer broker agreement. Um, I, of course, I do that for free. Just, just shoot me an email and I will happily help you prepare an amendment to your buyer broker agreement. Okay, so the next up, the next agreement switching back to the seller side, the listing side, we massively modified the showing comp the showing commission agreement for sellers who don't want to sign a listing agreement. It's now called a showing compensation agreement, no brokerage or agency relationship. And as you can see, a lot of it was cleaned up and removed. Very similar those before the seller allows the broker to show or market the property at a purchase price of X and attempt to procure for the seller a buyer on terms satisfactory to the seller. Notice there's no brokerage or agency relationship, so you have to provide the name or no brokerage or agency relationship disclosure form. And that is a, the notice form is a separate document. So if you do use this agreement, you need um, to also use the notice. Darian has a question. Yes, Darian. Hey, good morning, Sam. Can you hear me okay? I'm great. I hear you. Yes, sir. Excellent. Hey, thanks for doing this uh, this training, man. We really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, not to get too far off topic, but on the buyer broker agreement form that you had up there a minute ago, you know, if we have a buyer and we have the conversation with them about compensation and they say, listen, don't show me any properties. I don't want to see anything where they're not offering compensation for you. And I heard you use the language concessions. So how do we, how do we approach that? I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of, you, you really have to tell the buyer, I am not allowed to filter listings by compensation. Okay. You really have to tell them that, and 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 you say I would be in violation of my code of ethics, and this and and I assume you've spoken to them about the settlement agreement. Oh yes. You, you would explain to the buyer, uh, I would get I would lose my license if I if I tried to only show you properties that that had compensation offered. I can I can filter by concessions, but I cannot filter by compensation. And if they don't understand that, then you you have an impasse. And I know that's frustrating to hear, but. That's what the settlement agreement says. And as a realtor, as a member of NAR, you're subject to it. It puts you somewhat as a disadvantage to, to like a Thompson broker or a non-NAR member, but that is that is the rule. Okay. So if I if, if I end up showing properties and you know we see 10 properties and then I start emailing the agents about compensation or concession, and somebody says, Well, we don't offer concession. I mean, at that point, my buyer could 
elect to just filter that on their own. I'm not filtering it. The buyer is. Correct. You, the buyer says, I don't want to see that property. And, and there's nothing you can do, but obviously you can't drag them to the property. So, so, um, you would just say, okay, I won't take you to this property. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. And Yola, you are correct. Some agents don't tell you, um, what the what the compensation is going to be and they want to see the property anyways and jillian you are also correct that's probably the best way to say it you should not care what the compensation is because you don't know what the seller's motivation and what they'd be willing to negotiate you you've agreed the buyers agreed to pay you a percentage or a flat fee and you go from there okay so we just went through, uh, scrolling back up here, as you can see the showing agreement, you can see it's been it's been quite pared down. Um, again, the, the broker compensation language are not, are fully negotiable, not set by law. Um, but then you get into the, the compensation and this is um, very clearly different than the listing agreement. It's very simple, if the broker procures a buyer who is ready, willing, and able to purchase with, and they enter into a contract within so many calendar days after the date of this, of the effective date of this showing agreement, then the seller shall pay the following compensation at closing. And you put a percentage of your purchase price here, and you see this and here, and your flat fee for your transaction fee here, or a fee and you put your total comp fee here or other. Um, again, if the seller defaults, then they owe the money uh, to you as the, as, the, as the listing agent and any deposits paid by the, um, any deposits paid by a buyer procured by the broker or retained by the, and retained by the seller following the termination of the contract as a percentage of the total of the total deposit retained, you would get a share of that. So that's what this says. That basically, if, if the buyer defaults and the seller gets the deposit, you get a piece of the deposit, up to 50% of the deposit, but not to exceed your total compensation. So some of these are other minor changes about venue if you in a lawsuit and attorney's fees. And then Again, everybody signs, seller and the broker. Okay, the next agree the next form we're going to look at is the broker compensation agreement. So the broker compensation agreement is how you negotiate the the compensation between the agents. You put your listing broker here. We can't highlight for some reason. You put your buyer broker name here and you put the property address and, and neighbor requires you to put the buyer's name as to who it's going to be. This replies to on the broker compensation agreement. Farbar makes this optional and that's probably the better way to do it, especially if you don't want to reveal who your buyer is immediately to the listing agent. Um, again, neighbor has made the decision that you will put the buyer's name here and it limits it to that, limits the compensation payment to that, if that buyer buys the property. So the listing broker is entered into a listing contract with the seller of the property in order for the listing broker to provide brokerage services. The listing broker agrees to pay the buyer's broker compensation equivalent to the following, and you put your percent of the purchase price plus your transaction fee or a flat fee um, or other. Other, of course, is here. This is um, the compensation due to the buyer's broker is paid at closing. Um, and then the rest of this is kind of your standard language that it has to be modified in writing, signed by both parties. That's pretty typical in all of our agreements. We do have require arbitration. If the, um, where is it here, arbitration. If the uh, 
party, if the if the brokers go to it, they go to Nabor arbitration. And then uh, again, you've got your 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 admonishment that real estate brokers and broker compensation not set by law and is fully negotiable. And again, you're going to see that on every form. This is a 2024 form. Again, make sure you're looking at the dates. Questions about this form before I move on? Catherine, where does it say what pay what is paid to the buyer's broker on the showing agreement? Catherine, the showing agreement is between the listing agent and the um, the seller. It does not, and it does not state a, a compensation to the buyer's broker. It the the showing agreement kind of presumes that you have the buyer already. And if that's the case, now post settlement, you should have a buyer broker agreement signed. And if there's going to be compensation paid between the, the buyer, the seller and the buyer's broker, which is you, then you're going to need a, a separate agreement for that. So that actually makes you have to have three agreements. And I, again, I apologize for all the confusion on the on the agreements, but neighbors put out a lot of a lot of new forms. Farbars put out new forms, and we have to learn them and and use them in our in our practices. These these are our new tools. Okay, other questions about this this broker compensation agreement? Patricia is asking: Is the form presented with the sales agreement? Patricia, I would I would ask this. Um, I would try to get this broker compensation agreement signed before I went and did the showing so I know what's be, what the offer is. And and one thing you can do if you know what the offer of compensation is and you haven't toured the home, then when you do sign your buyer broker agreement before you tour the home, you can make the match. If everyone understands that. All right, so the next form we have is this is just the new construction broker services disclosure form. Um, they just made some changes to this. I've actually never seen this form used, but it is it is a, a NABOR form that's provided that's been modified post settlement. Okay, I'm going to switch over now to the sales contract and talk about those changes. But before I do that, what questions do people have about the listing and brokerage side? Go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself or, or type them into the chat. Anybody questions? Everybody understand what's going on? All right. Sales contract. Okay. This is the... Much uh, ballyhooed the famous Nabor sales contract. And you can see right off the bat, sales contract, we have added solar panels and related equipment are now part of the real property that's being conveyed. Uh, they were always screwed or glued, but some of the related equipment might not have been. So now it's included in the contract and goes with the property. The next big change here is the um, we added the word identified. A lot of realtors wrote in to the Legal Resources Committee requesting clarification on how this is supposed to be filled out. The number of parking spaces offered with the listing is does not go in this blank. This blank is to identify the proper the the parking space. Um, by however it is, however it is designated by the association. So it's parking space 1A or 202 or whatever it is. You put the parking space information here, not the number of parking spaces. Next up in the sales contract, we add a default de days for when the deposits are due. Whoops. Get rid of that. Default days are three. If you do not put a, uh, a number in this blank and a second deposit, if you choose to have a second deposit is due 15 days after the effective date, if you do not put something in the blank. Again, uh, the NABOR forms note the date of the contract is October 1st. 
This is the most recent contract, and the new forms will be are already they're already loaded, um, and they're available on neighbor.com, But 2024, December, October, one of 2024 is going to be your sales contract effective date. Okay. Up next, we uh, clarify that the seller is giving access and possession of the property at closing. It's not when the seller gets their funds. It's at closing, they must give up the keys. And uh, we clarify that even further down below and I'll get to that in a few minutes. The next change, we deleted this statement about the buyer being required to provide an Equal Credit Opportunity Act statement of termination or I'm sorry, a statement of a denial of a loan before they can terminate the contract. Um, it, it, it used to be there was a standard form that the lender would provide for the denial. That is no longer the case. So we just simply deleted this language and a buyer is required to provide any statement of some of, of substance showing an adverse credit action from the lender. So if the lender simply writes a letter that says the buyer was denied for their loan, then the buyer can terminate provided they haven't waived the finance contingency. Okay, this is kind of a big change. Special assessments. We all love association special assessments. It's now a defined term. Special assessment is now a defined term. And it, recall before, the NABOR contract had a strict default that the seller would pay off any special assessments that came due but prior to the effective date of the contract and the, buy, the, the seller paid and the buyer paid anything due after the effective date of the contract. Now you have a choice. The seller or buyer shall pay installments due after the closing date. If you, if the, if you select seller, then the seller pays in full. Again with the dates. Okay, this is more for title agents, but realtors need to know about this. Um, if the title comes back from the title company or the closing attorney, and it's got the requirements to clear title on it, and then something happens, somebody dies, somebody gets married, somebody gets divorced, uh, as long as the requirement is a new requirement or defect or encumbrance that is, was not available on the effective date of the contract, then the buyer gets a new opportunity to make title uh, objections. Why is this important? Title objections extend the closing for up to 30 days. I'm just highlighting this. Within the 30-day clearance period, commencing on the date buyer provides notification and copies to seller of the new title defect. See that? The buyer can extend the contract by finding new title defects. So of course, this is very rare. I would say in my office, it's one in 20 that, that, that uh, something new happens, somebody passes away, somebody gets married, somebody files for divorce. Um, but the, but it is an op, it has been an issue and they did address it in the contract. Okay. Catherine was asking on special assessments, if monies are returned for whatever reason, who gets those monies, the previous owner or the new owner? Well, Catherine, the, you, if you have an insurance claim out there, like you're asking, you would have to negotiate that and do an amendment, an addendum to contract. And that should be done at the time of contracting. That's not something covered by the contract. Okay. Okay, so the survey change here used to be the seller had to provide whatever they had in their possession. Now they only have to provide a survey if it's um, certified to the seller. That's a minor change. And the clearance period for survey objections commences on the date the survey objections are delivered to the seller. Again, a possible extension of the closing date if there are survey objections, because remember, the surveyor does, has until five days prior to closing 
to get the survey out. So you may be five days prior to closing and find out you have an additional 30 day extension. So that, that's very, very important to understand that. Okay. Um, there is a new required flood insurance disclosure. There is a new required flood insurance disclosure. Don't miss that. You must have that on every contract. Um, Mary, I, I can put these, I can put the contracts with the highlights up. I can email those out if you want them. Uh, that the next change is a spelling error. Okay, so how many times have you done a radon test and the uh, radon came back below at, above the EPA action level? The seller does a radon test that comes back below the action level, and then you fight about the picocuries uh, of radon in the property. And um, now you would just use the average. So Namor clarified that problem and just said, you look at the average level. If it's above four picocuries, then you have a radon problem that has to be remedied by the seller. Okay. These changes you see here in red are, are formatting changes. Buyer's election is, just, is not a capitalized, buyer should not be capitalized. Uh, again, this is a formatting change, just clarifying that if the, if the uh, buyer does not have the inspection items done or fails to make inspections or fails to timely make their election, then they, then they accept the property as is. Another change, see here, sunken or uneven pavers are cosmetic. They've always been cosmetic. Now it's clear that they're cosmetic in the neighbor contract. Okay, uh, this change here in the risk of loss provision, this is mostly a formatting change to clarify and a definitional change. Ironically, we didn't have storm in our definition of casualty and now, now storms are included in the definition of casualty. Okay, I, I mentioned this in the listing agreement. Sellers are obligated in the sales contract to provide all of applications for the association and property management contact information. Again, uh, this is gonna change again, and they are going to be required to provide the association documents for, for condominiums, which is, a required, which is required by law anyways, but it's not in the sales contract. Okay. Now, this next section looks like there's not too many changes. I will tell you, as the scribe of the committee, I'm already working on a rewrite of all of this, standard I. But for now, just know, oops, you must provide the annual financial statement and the annual budget. This is a change. This is a big change. A lot of, a lot of realtors will send me the condo docs and it will just have the budget. And previously that was wrong. Now it's right, but it's not enough. You must provide the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet and the annual budget. So there's this new, new document is the annual budget. Um, this next change here if the real property is located within a multi-parcel building, I don't think there are any multi-parcel buildings in Naples. Uh, Naples Bay Resort may be a multi-parcel building, but I'm not 100% sure. And I've not seen another one that could be a possibility, but this is required by state law, so we added it. Okay, the next change in the sales contract requires that the seller provide the applicable association forms and the 10 day clock for the buyer to apply does not start until they get the forms. What does this mean? It's even more important that you put the uh, associate, the condominium association documents in the applicable application forms in the MLS. 
Yes, Patricia, this includes HOAs. So if the buyer's got to apply to a condo or an HOA association, they don't have to do that until 10 days after the seller provides the forms. So the seller needs to provide the forms right away, like before the contract, like in the MLS. Okay, so take a look at this sentence here. This was very controversial at Namor, but we put it in the contract. The seller's receipt of their money after closing is not a prerequisite for them to vacate the property and give the keys to the buyer. The buyer gets the keys at closing with the deed. The seller gets the money at, immediately thereafter or at the same time, but they cannot hold up the keys while they're waiting for their wire. It's just the way the contract has always been and now it's more clear. Before I leave this, uh, Mary, you're asking the buyer, the, the buyer can cancel within 10 days if condo docs have not been provided. I uh, know, Mary, they can't cancel, but they are not going to be obligated to close because they don't have to make application to the association. An association application uh, is a prerequisite to closing. But uh, if you get to the closing date and the approval has not been received, then the buyer can terminate. Understand, Mary, you understand that? Okay. Okay. We talked about this. So notice there are now compensation, concession, and condo multi-parcel building addendum to contract have been added. Also note that the adet that pursuant to case law, the Addendums, addenda that you use must be fully executed and attached. That means the box has to be checked on the contract. Please don't mess this up. You're going to cause a lot of problems if you don't fully execute the addendums and check the boxes. That's that's case law. That's not neighbor. So you have to do it. And we're going to go over the compensation and concession addendums in a minute. Okay. None of this has changed. We changed this to buyer's broker. And again, with the dating, the 20, 2024, buyer's broker, bro, buyer's licensee. Questions on the sales contract? Changes. Anyone have questions? You can unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat. Okay. Seeing none. Oh, wait. Uh, Marianne, what do you mean, why the wording compensation? <coughs> you can unmute yourself and explain. In the list before you showed uh, commission, concession and compensation, so compensation of what? It's, a comp it's the addendum to contract for compensation. And I'm going to show you that right now. Okay. Give me give me one second to change sure. the share back to the the PowerPoint. Can everybody see the PowerPoint slides? Good. Give me one second. Okay. So let's talk about some of the neighbor sales contract addenda for compensation and concessions. Here is the concessions addendum. And I'm going to zoom in out so you can see it. Notice here you put your seller and your buyer relating to the following described property. You put your property address. And then the seller shall provide a credit to buyer at closing as follows. You check your boxes. They're going to provide a credit in the amount of X or percentage of the purchase price towards closing costs and prepaids. You can also check the box of a dollar amount or percentage towards buyer's compensation. And notice this is the concessions addendum. What this does is it creates a, um, 
uh, an obligation by the seller to provide credits at closing for either one of these or for other. Um, it is, it clarifies, you know, what kind of what, what the, and this, this is the signature blocks. It just clarify or makes it makes it clear without having to write it into the other terms and conditions of the contract what the concessions or compensation is going to be. Does everybody see you ever see that? If questions about the concessions, this is not the compensation addendum. This is the concessions addendum. And uh, if people have questions, go ahead and, and type them into the chat or, or unmute yourself. But while you're doing that, let's look at the compensation addendum. Whoops. See here, this compensation addendum creates a contingency on the contract where the set where the seller has to agree or the uh, to the compensation from the listing broker or from the seller directly for compensation to the broker. So I think that a lot of you might have been thinking, well, how do I get paid under these agreements earlier? And the if I've got a sales contract and I don't have my compensation set up yet, how do I get paid? And that's a really good question. You get paid by adding this addendum to sales contract for compensation, and you get the seller to agree to pay compensation in the contract. And that's what this is for. Everybody see that? Listing broker agrees to pay buyer broker at closing compensation of X as a dollar amount or percentage, or you check the box that the seller agrees to pay buyer broker compensation. And this second box here, this is what I'm seeing written into the contract a lot. Seller shall pay buyer's broker compensation of X at closing. That's really what's in here most of the time. Okay. And what it does is if the seller does not deliver a copy of a binding agreement for compensation, then the buyer can terminate within three days after the uh, uh, expiration of the delivery period, which is three days. So it's six days total. Everybody understand that? Questions about that? This is a new form. I'm seeing a couple of heads shaking yes. Do you have questions? Yeah, I, what, is, um, yes, that. what does the seller have to provide? I'm, I didn't quite understand. Within the three days? A, a, a binding agreement for compensation. So they have to sign uh, some type of broker-to-broker -broker agreement or, or um, a uh, the concession addendum could be used. Actually, you could, it's funny, you could use this addendum to sales contract for compensation, and then you could go back and negotiate this concession addendum and satisfy the requirement. Um, and yes, David, a seller may offer both compensation and concessions on the listing agreement and in the sales contract. Just be very, very careful if your buyer, if your seller expects to pay X and you put X as the compensation and then you put Y as the concessions, they're going to pay both. So be very careful how you do that. Hey, Sam. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Catherine. So on your listing agreement, if you put con compensation at X percent, a total compensation, you did not put a concession, you would need this other compensation agreement attached? You would, you would, this is for the sales contract, what you're looking at on your screen right now. Oh, so in, in okay. the, so if the if the listing agreement says X compensation shall be paid to the buyer's broker, then when you when you get your sales contract and it's got this addendum attached to it in the offer, I would go back to the other agent to the buyer's broker and say, hey, listen, I I'm entitled to offer you X compensation. Can we can we fill out this form and satisfy the contingency for providing buyers 
broker compensation. And that, that will get you there in terms of in terms of getting into a binding contract without a contingency. Does that make Thank sense? You. Yep. Okay. So so if you know what your compensation is, um, but you as the as the listing agent, but you get an offer and they didn't discuss it with you, then you can simply go back to the buyer's agent and say, hey, the cons the compensation is X, fill out the fill out this addendum. And let, let's go to closing. Okay. Other questions about these two forms? I think they're going to be used quite a bit. Okay. It, the way you're explaining yes, it, we have to actually use both of them. We can't just use... No, no. If you know what the compensation or the concessions are... You just add this addendum to sales contract for concessions. Okay, great. Don't know what the compensation uh, is going to be, but you know that you want compensation as the buyer's agent, then you would add this addendum for oh. compensation and you would negotiate it after the after the offer is submitted. And you have three days to do that. And so as a listing thought, agent, yeah. if we want to be prepared, we can fill out that first, the other form that you had up that one yep. we can fill that one out and we when we know that an offer is coming we can send it with the percentage that we know that was already agreed for the listing and give that to the agent who's writing the offer so you it's all ready that. to yes, go you could. Yes, okay you could. i would i would not suggest that these things be put in mls because they are negotiable under the settlement agreement but if, if you if the seller has said Darn it, I'm offering X to the buyer where the buyer's broker and they're going to take it uh, and it's a good number. You could just fill this out and give it to the buyer's agent to make it part of their offer. Yes, you could do that. Okay. Other questions about these two forms? They're very important and I want to make sure they're understood. Okay. All right. The... Um, the next form is the multi-parcel building addendum. And I'll zoom in on it. Again, not going to spend a lot of time on this form. I don't see this being used in the Naples area uh, very much. But if you if you have a multi-parcel building, you will know it because there will be condos and office space and maybe a hotel and whoever knows whatever else is in that building, uh, all in one building or one complex. And um you would then be required under state law to provide this form. Okay, Sheila, you're confused about which form to use for which situation. Um, go ahead, unmute yourself and ex ask me your question. Go ahead. Hi, Sam. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Sheila. Thank you. So I'm I'm confused. So if I don't know what the compensation is, uh, am I using the concession form? No, you would use the contingency compensation form, not the concession form. Okay. This is this form for compensation is to negotiate the compensation after the contract is signed. This okay. gives the buyer an out if the seller and buyer cannot agree on the compensation. Oh, thank you so much. I get it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Next. Next up, the comprehensive condo rider coming soon. <laughs> so Nabor has voted uh, to uh, create a comprehensive condo rider, as I mentioned in the sales contract portion of the presentation, standard I is going to be completely redone. There's going to be a comprehensive condo rider. It is not similar to Farbar. It's different. I've drafted it. It's being reviewed. And it will be coming soon, probably with the January 1 updates. Okay. Next up, the required flood dis insurance disclosure. Again, you must do this as of October 1st with every property. So what is it? Scrolling down. Seller has, has not filed a claim with the insurance provider related to flood damage. Seller has or has not received federal assistance for flood damage. You must ask the seller. You must check the box. And I think this form is a form 
you would put in MLS and have the buyer sign as part of the offer process. So show you the top so you know what you're looking at. Required flood insurance disclosure. Put this in MLS, filled out, signed by the seller, just like your HOA disclosure. Now you're going to do a flood disclosure as well. And um, hopefully you won't have a problem with flooding. Okay, so there's some questions. Uh, Yola, I do not know if Mercado is multi-parcel. I don't think so because the buildings are all separate. Mixed use is different than multi-parcel. Um, so be careful about that. Like like uh, Bayfront is not multi-parcel either. Uh, Catherine is asking, what if the seller is deceased? Catherine, I'm not understanding your question. If you can unmute yourself and ask it. Go ahead. And anybody else who has questions, go ahead. Oh, if the seller is deceased regarding flood um, and you don't know if there's been a claim filed, that's a great question. Uh, I would provide the form and just say, do not know on the form. And I'd write that in. That's a really good question. That's not addressed in the state statute. This language that was in that form is copied directly out of state statute. Hey, uh, Sam. Yes, sir, Mike. This is Mike. Um, just a, a quick question. For property management companies on annual reports, what financial reports are they are they required to provide all three reports that we now have in the contract? They are required by state statute. That's correct. Okay. They must provide a budget and annual financial statements, which includes the PL, the profit and loss statement, and the balance sheet. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Shout them out. It's free legal advice. You know? Of course, according to my disclaimer at the beginning, it's 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 not legal advice, but uh um Catherine is asking if property managers been made aware of this change. I, I hope so. I'm not a member of the property managers, the CAM Association, but I would I would assume so. I have a question about the solar. If there is not all paid and it is not a uh, shift, you cannot shift it to the next uh, buyer or owner, you have to pay off. That's for yes. sure. But yes. other, if there is the community or the city has a program where a part of it is released uh, or discounted from the city, moves that automatically to the next owner or how that has to be done. So you would have to prorate any debt and or pay off any debt or prorate any any payments on the settlement statement, Marianne, and that would all have to be discussed and reviewed. Okay. Because you have to know that and figure that out with the solar company, with the city, and with the buyer and the seller. And that's really something the title agent will take care of. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Yola is asking, are milestone inspection reports required to be delivered to the buyers? Yes, they will be at the end of the year. My, Yola. So end of the year, those milestone inspection reports and part of my comprehensive addendum that's going to be for condos addresses that. So that'll all come out shortly. Casey, what specific financial documents need to be included with the financing with the financials due to buyer? Again, that uh Casey, that's the budget, the PL, and the and the balance sheet. Other questions? Hey Sam. Yes, Catherine. So I'm still confused on the concession. Why does the concession say compensation to buyers when I'm thinking the cons compensation form is for buyers? You're talking about broker. these two forms? Buyers broker. Yeah, it says. It says compensation towards buyer's broker compensation. And this is on the concession one, right? Right. And that's very confusing. I'm not sure why I was not on the yeah. draft of this, but Nabor decided that the concessions could include compensation. So remember, Far Bar, no did a different thing. Far Bar did a different thing where they said the seller could pay the compensation directly to the buyer's broker. Nabor has it more of a, as, as part of the concessions. Yeah, that's what's been throwing me off your whole presentation. 
Yeah, so Nabor did it a little different than Farbar. Nabor allows you to offer a um, compensation as one thing and concessions as something else. And then they say in the listing agreement and in the buyer broker agreements that concessions may go towards compensation, which so is So why confusing. have the compensation agreement? Why do we need two forms then? Well, this, this, you don't need two forms. This form that you're looking at on your screen right now is the addendum to contract where the seller agrees to pay compensation or, or, or concessions. And they pick one or both. The next form that I showed you is a contingency. So the contract is contingent on the seller delivering to buyer a binding agreement establishing the compensation. So this is a, the, the other form is not a contingency. The other form is just money going from the seller to the buyer's broker um, or from the seller to the buyer for concessions. This is a contingency to negotiate compensation. So one form is used when you know the concessions and the compensation prior to the offer. This form is when you do not know. And this form is the compensation form? This is for this is for compensation. That's right. You don't know. Okay. So if the seller if the listing agent refuses to tell you the compensation as an example, but you want to make sure that you get paid, you would use this compensation addendum. Okay. And you would negotiate the concessions as a part of the compensation as part of the offer, and then you would get paid at closing based on what's negotiated. Thank you. That's what was hanging me up. Sorry. Yep. Good, good questions. What is if I put? Oops, sorry, Marianne. I'm, I'm, I'm mute yourself. I hit that about my accident. Sorry. Uh, what is if I put that directly in the contract in the lines on page 11 or something uh, that the seller has to compensate the buyer agent by what X amount or percentage? And that's it instead of that's using it. You could do that. You don't need this form then. You would not use you would not use this form if you wrote it into the contract. This form is designed so that realtors don't have to draft language for the contract. Yeah, I did but that. I, you could use this exact language. You could write right into the contract, seller shall provide a credit to buyer at closing in the amount of X towards closing costs and prepays. Or you might write in there, seller shall provide a credit to buyer at closing in the amount of X towards broker compensation. And I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah, because that, that makes it easier to handle it up front and they can say yes or no, or then it goes in negotiation immediately. But if if you have two, three forms, why not to say it clear and clear? I know I want to as a, as a buyer agent, 3% or 4%. Or uh, no numbers, come on. No, but on the contract, you put the numbers. You put the numbers, put X on the contract. That's right. But yeah. if you, if and you then put they X can, or okay. you could put... You have two choices. You can write it into the contract, which realtors are not supposed to write things into the contract, or you can use this form. That's what this form is for. But then when I did that, all fine, we are already on the process to close. My realtor, realtor not the realtor, the, the agency asked me to have additional this form, but that's not needed in my it's view. It's not needed, no. Okay, then I'm right. So I just had to fight that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're right. Good. Yola is asking, is the new sales contract ready for us to use? Yes, Yola. It's loaded into form simplicity and neighbor.com. Other questions? All righty, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time today to uh, work to tune in. If you have any questions or if anything comes up in the future, you can always contact me. Um, I look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.